secondary education and workforce development at Wested. Um, along with Kathy Booth, I supervise a tiny team of about 20 people um, focused on really on issues around economic mobility, um, equity, equitable access to higher education, um, areas like transition from secondary to post-secondary education, from adult education to college and post-secondary education. Um, we do a lot of work in guided pathways. We do a lot of work with data tools for those of you who have followed our journey in building the launch board over the years. So we are very excited to be here today. My job is basically to say that, introduce my team, show you the agenda, and then exit stage left. Um, so if we could go to the team slide. Um, I just, we'll, instead of having everyone introduce themselves, I, we agreed I was gonna introduce them. Yes, it is true. If your name is Alexandra or Alexandria, and if you've met Alexandra Bolelo, who is also on our team, you can get a job at Westhead. So if you are if you have one of those names, please feel free to contact me immediately. It's like, clearly I have a preference for that name. Um, so Blair Wilson Toso, um, who has literally has a doctorate in adult education. I didn't know such a thing existed until I, until I met Blair. Um, she has 20 years experience in adult education, um, family literacy, career pathways, um, Blair is part of a team that is actually working on the new toolkit, the, the new Octay toolkit for IETs for English language learners. Um, that's a big federal project that we're a part of. Um, and she also supports a lot of work, a lot of research work in adult education. We have IES grants and other mathematics instruction grants as well. Um, Alexandra Lozanoff, who um, is a, her, her primary core expertise in the team is professional development. So she works across all of our projects um, and is a savant in both professional development and human-centered design, and mostly recently helped lead a three-year project with a bunch of four-year universities, helping them build career development uh, processes and models um, to implement at their campuses. And then finally, the newest member of our team, Alexandria, right, um, who just came up to us from Ventura, and some of you may know her because she actually worked um, in adult education down in Southern California, um, as, a, as, as a part of CAPE there. Alexandria is an expert in, she, she's an economist and a labor market expert um, and a data savant. And we're very, very excited to have her here today as well. Next. Um, so this is the agenda, it is packed. So we will talk too fast and tell you too much um, and then expect you to also have great dialogue. We're gonna do all that in 90 minutes. Um, we're gonna talk about sort of the kinds, you know, what, what the evaluation process is you should be going through as you get ready to do your three-year plan, how you evaluate the needs of your community, how you evaluate your programs and your services to really think honestly and be courageous about areas where you think you can really do more, be better. Um, we'll talk about approaches to evaluation. Um, and then we'll talk about um, the consortium and program evaluation process through basically three different lenses. So the fact sheets that you have access to as of today, um, include customized um, de demographic information pulled from the American Community Survey data for your consortium region. Um, and they also include equity views. We're kind of, we're trying to double down a little bit on equity this year and really just ask in an exploratory way, what does equity mean in adult education when pretty much most, most of the people you serve actually would be described as, as equity populations. Um, we have um, selected data we have pulled um, about, about the Cape student populations. And so there's, there's actually a view in the fact sheets for that. And then Alexandria is gonna talk about um, labor market information um, and the way we've also displayed that for your region. All of this is customized for you, for your consortium to really kind of look collectively together to ask questions about what you wanna be focusing on in the next three years. Um, and then we're gonna talk, we're gonna do a little data equity walk that Alexandra I'm sure will be leading. Um, We'll talk about asset mapping and really how to put it all together in the process. And then we'll have some time at the end for questions. And with that, I'm going to pass it over to Blair. Super. Thank you, Randy. Hi, everyone. I'm delighted to be here. I know that you all are participating and have available to you several um, different presentations on evaluation. So this is meant to be a complementary piece to that, really to introduce and overview some of the tools you can use for your evaluation and how they might fit into that evaluation. As Randy said, it's, it's going to be fast. We've been really developing some tools and information that we're very, very excited about. So 
I, I'd like to say upfront, this is more of a sampler um, presentation and we will be happy to uh, respond to any requests for more in-depth training. We'll be doing some additional follow-up webinars on smaller topics, but this is really the overview of what we are, um, what we're about. So to set the stage, we're going to talk about data uses. And just as a reminder, there's three, what we consider three kinds of data, and there's the interesting, the useful, and the actionable data. And that will, they will come into play in your evaluation and as you conduct your needs assessment for your three-year plan. Um, the interesting data is really, it alerts you to something that's going on, which a lot of what you already use is what is happening. And the useful data is that which makes you go, hmm, look at that. That's, I think something's going on there. And it looks, it calls out sort of the structural um, aspects of your work. And that's one of the reasons why we're focusing on equity um, and maybe some of the gaps that appear in there, or at least that to, to, to will signal to think about those. And then the actionable data helps you, um, helps you answer questions that you're asking and offer you guidance as to what you might want to do um, to resolve or to respond to the question and the answer. So we'll just briefly cover some of the components of the elements that your primary activities that you're gonna to want to conduct in evaluating your program and services. Uh, we'll introduce them here and then address some of the concepts more in depth as we continue through this webinar. So key to your uh, program evaluation, obviously is digging deeper than identifying just the activities of your individual programs. You're going to want to learn about your current learners, your community members, your labor market information, and asking questions in regards to all of those. Are you meeting the local population's needs and accelerating their academic career and life goals? Um, and sussing out who are your prospective learners, not just who you're serving, but who are your learners in your community, your consortium? Um, who are they? What are their goals? And identify some of their barriers. And you can see there's a slew of questions and all the questions that you see are prompt questions. They're not a full list. And certainly you all will be able to think of more um, questions and have many of you already have experience with this process. So um, these are some of ours and we encourage you to take a look at them and throughout once you get the PowerPoint. Um, I do wanna note that while we're presenting this in a linear fashion, um, that this is an iterative process. As many of you know, you'll collect some data then you'll think, hmm, here's that. That begs more questions and we go on throughout that. So while these are um, structured, this is not necessarily the flow of how you will conduct your evaluation and needs assessment. So you're going to, moving into that, you're going to want to gather data for informed de decisions. So yeah, because the data lets you know that something's going on, it can um, help you uncover root causes, um, it can root out, uh, identify trends, structural issues such as equity gaps. And you know, and again, that actionable data, as you continue digging into your data, the useful data, um, it will, they will begin to tell you things and then you dig further into that data to inform your decisions so that you can take action. We'll guide you to developing a well-informed plan that's responsive to your learner's needs. And just as a note, one of the other reasons why we gather data is because we oftentimes come to these uh, planning sessions thinking that we know things. We rely on what we think we know or what we've observed or what we've heard or what somebody else brings it to us. But what is, but gathering data and allowing that data to inform your decisions, as it says on the slide, it provides you with evidence to what is, um, what's really going on. And it might move us out of the space of just thinking about what is important to us or our programming and it allows you to have a larger context to understanding your setting. You want to identify some of those relevant data sources. You know, we'll talk about some quantitative data that we can you can access. Um, we'll talk about focus groups and interviews, and then also looking at pathways and best practices, such as literature surveys and um, other notable programs. And we always like to call out colleagues are really helpful in sharing and gathering data. Lastly, there's, um, or a part of this is your asset mapping and your gap analysis. Um, we'll go over that briefly. I was delighted to hear Veronica say that you all will have a more in-depth 
uh, presentation on asset mapping and gap analysis and because we're really looking at it as to how it fits into this process. Um, it's a key activity for your program uh, evaluation as it helps identify opportunities as well as prompt deeper questions as to what's available to whom um, and what those and what might be missing and how you fill those gaps. And then your last component would be planning, right? And we, as you all know, while some of you, we talk about this as program evaluation, it's also about how do you fit into a consortium and, and the interplay among members um, in your consortium, excuse me, in your consortium. Um, so you want to identify feasible and relevant courses of action. And as you do this collab collaboratively, based on all the, the data you've given, uh, you've gathered, as well as um, some of the activities that you've engaged in. And you'll be able to identify your, um, what we call your equity tactics. As I said, we've really got to push to looking at those gaps in your consortium, um, because many of you do, are doing a really good job of serving um, um, some of the population, but maybe there are populations that you might want to target a little bit more. So, and then I, once you've identified those gaps and you've set, um, you can set your goals and your targets and um, always identifying new member roles. So briefly, some of the key resources we're going to highlight today. Um, there's the Cape Fact Sheets, which are brand new. They went live last night. We're very excited about them. Um, the Adult Education Pipeline Dashboard, which most of you are familiar with. Um, we'll just briefly talk about the California Regional Education and Workforce Dashboard. Uh, and then we'll introduce another couple of resources um, that Lexi will present on uh, the Low Income Policy Map, which and the um, American Community Survey, their county commuting patterns. And these are just pieces to help you refine and dig in and demonstrate that there are a few other resources. Um, and as we go along, we hope that as we touch on different topics that you'll be sharing some of the resources that you have found particularly helpful in creating a three-year plan or your yearly plan and exploring the demographics and the needs of your consortium. Before we move on, we wanted to talk about there are two sort of main approaches that you can take to doing a needs assessment or your program evaluation. One is you start with a question, right? You come to it already knowing what you want to ask. Um, then you explore the data and refine your questions based on that data. And then you collect and explore more data. The other way is to actually start with the data, explore the data, and then let the data lead you to the questions. And then you can collect and explore more data. We suggest that you follow that second one where you start with the data. Again, because sometimes when you start with a question, it might not be the correct question. It might be based on what I was talking about earlier that we have, we think we know what's going on. Um, and if we, but if we start with the data, then you can really push on what we know um, and move into what do we really need to address. And later in this session, Alex is going to, lead us through a data equity walk, which will really help you um, understand the concept of starting with the data and offer you a way to do this within your organization, your institution, or within your, um, your consortium. And we all know this, but I wanted to make sure that before we move forward, that as we go through these, um, looking at this data, as you conduct your needs assessment, that really it needs to, you wanna keep that learner in mind. Um, it's they're central to the process. They are one of our primary client, climate, uh, clients. And we'll even suggest that, um, you know, when we're talking about the asset mapping, that you bring them into the process. Or alternatively, you could also try a learner walk where you put yourselves in the shoes of a learner accessing and experiencing adult education programming to give a more humanized look at the data that you're collecting and the asset mapping. So putting yourself into that from a different perspective than how you generally will go into this process. So now we're gonna talk a little bit about the program evaluation, um, exploring the data and the data tools. So first we would recommend that you explore your consortium demographics. I undoubtedly you all have already done this, um, but you want to do this because it provides a background for determining if your services are reaching the intended audience. Um, and it will offer you insights into questions such as the demographic makeup, 
Um, where do underserved populations live and who's in most in need of adult education services? And we always wanna go back to that, how do we know they're in need of services, which takes you back to that, um, the use of data um, and, and how you, you need to provide evidence for the information that you're gathering or the questions that you're ask, answering. Uh, and feel free to um, put in the chat any other questions that you have asked of your about your consortium demographics or that you think we should ask um, and share those out with your colleagues who might be building a question bank of those. And uh, to a note to the team, if you could read out any questions that come up, I can't see the chat right now. I'm gonna pause before we go on, anything, anybody wanna say anything? All right, thank you. So we are excited to go and see the Cape Fact Sheets. We'll be introducing them here. As I said, they went live last night. Um, we've had a whole team of people updating the data and we gathered some input and some feedback on, um, on how these could be used and what needed to change um, from the last time they were, they were revised. And um, so let me, Go to my new share. And there they are. Um, these are our new fact sheets. You'll see up along the, up the top that there are four tabs and we'll start off with the population demographics. So we've got the demographics. These are the ACS um, survey from 2015-2019. As a note, of course, once we were finished doing the analysis so that we could use the ACS for consortium um, boundaries, then the census released their new data. So we will be um, updating this to the, the newest census data. So by the end of October, this page will be refreshed with that information. So um, thanks for your patience while we get that, but it's very, you know, it's an, we'll give you a, a, a good look at what's going on in the consortium already. So a couple of the key features is you can select your consortium through this drop-down menu. Um, we, they, they should all be there. If you notice you're not there, then we let us know immediately so we can make sure you are there. But we, um, we have reviewed that and um, there should be, everyone should be there. I'd like to draw attention to your question mark here. Um, this is where you can get additional resources resources. and But what I particularly like to draw attention to is that there we did develop a Kate fact sheet, how-to guide of some of the information we're presenting here in this webinar is um, cataloged in there, but it also offers you a walkthrough. It will give you a, um, there are screenshots that will really walk you through the different features of this and talk a little bit about where the data comes from and how you might want to use this data to inform your processes. So at a glance, so if you look here currently, this is all the, it's the overall population. And as noted here, we did take the WIOA definition because we know many of you have um, our WIOA 2 funded. And so we have the 16, it is from 16 forward. Um, so there is that. But each of these icons, we have adult with disabilities, foreign born, limited English, near poverty or less, which is at 150%, um, whether someone has their high school diploma, whether they're in, unemployed. And we also included disconnected youth, um, which is youth that are 16 to 24. And we added that category because we think it's important. It's a key demographic for many of us. And it is one that we anticipate might be needing some extra services due to COVID, um, uh, the pandemic and implications of the pandemic. But each of these, once you click on them, will refresh to give you a view of exactly only that population. So it refines down to, um, to these populations. And so that, that is that primary, that's the way that um, fact sheet uses. So it's, we've um, designed it so that the information is provided in, in a format to help you easily explore the dense census data provided by the ACS um, and We'll look at each one of those tabs a little bit more thoroughly as we walk through and it aligns with some of the pieces that we think are part of an evaluation. All right, now I'm gonna turn over the screen to Lexi and she will 
take you through some of the um, labor market information. Good afternoon, everyone. All right, I think at this point, um, let's see here. I'm gonna share my screen. And Blair, are we going uh, directly into labor market information or are we hitting the low income policy map? So yes, it is the low income policy okay. map. So we're on the <laughs> LMI. We have it categorized as LMI data. So I always call it LMI data, apologies, <laughs> yes. No problem, no problem whatsoever. Um, I just wanted to share with you a resource when it comes to adult education planning. Um, one of our primary objectives is to increase access to low-income communities. Um, and to that end, there's actually a new resource out there um, as an effect of the latest coronavirus pandemic. Um, and so this is a policy map that identifies low-income communities by census tract. And so when you open up this, this link that we've provided you um, in the toolkit, you'll end up with a map of the entire United States. And then from there, you can kind of start to zero in, right, on your area. The purple areas being low income community tracks. Um, you can also stick in specific addresses. You can stick in the addresses of your adult schools um, to really check out what's going on there. Um, and again, the purpose of this is to really um, stimulate questions um, and facilitate discussion on increasing access to adult education um, and, for, uh, and further identifying those populations in need. Um, just to give you a little background, this map was created by the U.S. Small Business Administration for the purpose of identifying low-income communities that housed um, small businesses that were eligible for economic aid. Um, so, Hey, let's why not use it for adult education planning and to better familiarize ourselves with our territories. Um, one of those things, like I said, you could do is probably stick your addresses in of all your satellite campuses or, all, or your adult schools, see where they're located, and this might assist in targeting those underserved populations. All right, I'll hand it back over to Blair. Sorry, I should have said up front, we, we're doing a lot of navigating between different um, different screens and different resources. So it's uh, it's not my forte, so please be patient. I was trying to answer a couple of the questions in the chat. Um, the American Community Survey, the demographic data, that is from the Census Bureau, the um, their survey data set. And that was, yes, it was taken out of there. Um, but I'm sure they cleaned it up once they published it, but that was uh, configured by our um, a team of data analysts um, and data scientists on our uh, at West Ed. And um, on the, the uh, Kathy, you were asking, Kathy Keeley, you were asking about a way to drill down on these categories. And um, so the, the drill down is only in that we can um, separate them out by these distinct categories and then look at them through the lens of here. If you do hover over, oh, I'm, I'm acting like you can see, let me share my screen, apologies. If you hover over here, they will give you a little more information um, about the numbers and the percentages, percentages. But that is that is the depth that you can get through as it gets broken down through these pieces. Um, and then, for example, you there is not a way to find out whether they are that ethnicity, how it crosswalks over onto gender. Yeah, did that did that make sense? Hopefully, feel free to keep posting, and when I'm off screen, I will be sure to check the chat. Oh, great! Thank you, Kathy. All right, let me go ahead and share. Go back. Oh, apologies. I see. I get. Um, so the link, uh, Lexi did post the link in the chat, but when this is when the PowerPoint is um, 508 compliant. It will come out and all of these links will be live. Um, and as I said, in that how-to guide on the American community, I mean, on the fact sheets, you can navigate to that and there are, these links are in there as well. All right, so you document your CAPE demographics and outcomes. Um, and so you're asking questions like, what are the rates of, um, of the, 
Uh, sorry, let me make that a smoother transition. You have now demo, uh, you have charted the demographics, you've explored the demographics of your consortium. Then the next step we would um, suggest is to document your Kate demographics and outcomes, which um, you all do uh, on a regular basis through your different reports. And you're asking for these, now you're asking particularly about the group of um, your learners that you are serving. And you are asking about what's going on there, what are rates for retention, what CAPE programs are most enrolled, rates of EFL. And these are these questions are aligned with some of the um, metrics that you've been asked to report on, on for NOVA. Um, so, and you wanna dig in a little bit deeper because the evaluation of your program isn't simply about how effective your program is. it is. You may have excellent programming, However, digging into some of these questions, um, you might identify that you're only serving a small um, group of people um, or a particular student demographic. And so which this will help prompt you to think, um, rethink aspects of your programming and then widen your impact. Um, So I'm just going to take you all out. I think everyone is really familiar with the um, adult education pipeline dashboard, but I just wanted to go into a couple of the ways that you can use uh, the, the dashboard to drill down into some of these different disaggregate date your data and um, look at explore some of these equity gaps that might appear. So this should look familiar to all of you. Um, and so, for example, let's just go into, you know, you've got your tiles here. And if um, we will be doing webinars and we have some great resources online, if um, you are unfamiliar with the AEP dashboard, please ping me and, and uh, through my email or in the chat and we'll reach out and give you some of those resources and certainly alert you to when we're doing um, dashboard specific. Uh, presentations, or if you're in the one to three years as a new um, consortium leader, then you can uh, attend the webinar that's going on tomorrow where we'll really dig into the dashboard, uh, both the history and how to use it and the different metrics. Um, so let's go and see, let's, so for example, if we go to successes, and then we can look at, take a peek at the GED, um, those who earned a high school diploma. And you, when you first see it, it will set on your time trend, which is information, right? But it really doesn't tell you very much. It really resides in that first set of data. And then you wanna drill down into it and let's say, look at the race ethnicity. And here you'll be able to take a look at, so what, what is going on in the program? I would like to note that when you, what you want to do is these, when we look at these bars, they are related to that particular, the success rate of that particular particular race or ethnicity. So you really would like to hover over on top of this and say, for example, here, you've got, um, while the, the Hispanic is really high, when you look at the percentage, you're actually only 4% of, um, of those enrolled are achieving the high school equivalency or a GED adult diploma. So that is a quick look. Oh, the other piece you can do, you can also look at whether they are first time, um, what the rates are of first time or of students or of returning or continuing students. Any questions about that? Super. Again, and then also, obviously, you all know that you can also look at your TOPS Pro and your enterprise data and your MSI, MIS data, so to give a little bit more information about that. So one of the unique features that we have been able to do is we were able to drill down and ask some questions of the adult education pipeline data. And I'm going to share a little bit of a resource that is um, was done for our own purposes, but we thought that the information, excuse me, was so interesting that we wanted to share some of the key data points that we recently dug into. And I will um, hop into that. So 
And this is really a very unique, um, very small dashboard that answers some of the questions. For example, what were the barriers to employment and to what extent did the adults serve to have them? And these you can look at by, by micro region. They are not done by consortium, but you can look and see, you can divide out and, see, and um, you can parse out by different demographics as well as by your um, ethnicity and race to be able to determine what barriers might be, um, what one might be experiencing. So for example, we want to take race ethnicity and we wanted to say, what are the, um, let's see, uh, Hispanic students, what are some of their most, the barriers that they're most experiencing? Not, it won't much surprise you as we know low income and some of these are really highlighted. However, I think it's interesting to be able to really drill down and look at some of those in detail and make a cogent um, argument um, for why you're going to focus on particular barriers or supporting learners in particular ways dependent on your region. Um, as a quick look, this was the last one. I just wanted to take a walk through on some of the others. So we look at some of the um, annual earnings and wages um, and then employment and then um, participant award. And you can see that again, you get to, you can select a locale and then you can also go by demographic. And then there are like participation rates and things like that. So this is a really deep resource that we wanted to offer you um, that has been insightful for us, answering some of our key questions and then um, being able to drill down into some of those pieces. Any other questions? All right, are you able to see my PowerPoint or did it disappear? Um, we can see it, Blair. And also we had a question asking if this is on the AEP site. Um, so maybe you could clarify where this dashboard is available. No, this is not on the AEP site. This is work that was done at Westead um, and it was done as an alternative project. So it is, a, it is currently being hosted um, on a West Ed Tableau site. However, we're hoping to be able to move it into um, a space that has a little bit more, um, pub. it's more public facing, but for the moment it's hosted by West Ed. Any other questions? Okay. All right, I'm gonna take you back and um, also show you another feature that we added to the um, CAPE fact sheets. So I said you have your population um, demographics, and then we wanted to give a little bit more of a look at some of the of some of the um, of at transitions, which we think is a is a very important piece for all of us to be attentive to. And I'm going to scroll up a little bit, and it's just a, a look at what's going on in your programs. And you can see that these are broken out, and you can see them all in one space where you can look at um, race, ethnicity, by gender and then by age category as well. And again, you're going to want to um, select your consortium and let me see, I had one pulled up. That's what I had right there. And you can see where your transitions are occurring, right? That they are working. Um, you can see the overall transitions to post-secondary and then they're broken up into the two categories as you would see them on the AEP. So that was just another little preview or a view of what you can expect from the um, Cape fact sheets. I just haven't disappeared. So now that you've looked at some of your CAPE um, outcomes and you've looked at your demographics, 
one of the things that now what you want to do is compare your community demographics versus your CAPE adults served. Um, and this will help you, if you overlay them, they will help you identify pockets of, the of opportunity where you might want to expand or bolster your services. Um, and if you are actively engaging this data work, if you've already done the community demographics and you've looked at your CAPE um, um, outcomes and demographics, you'll probably already have an idea about what you're going to see. But as you begin to make those conclusions, make sure you go back to it, overlay them, and have the data to back them up. And we did add this to a feature of um, the CAPE fact sheets um, to provide you with a quick look at some of the uh, some side by side data from the ACS um, to your adult education pipeline demographic data. Claire, a question about the transition um, data yes. in particular um, is transition to post secondary. Does that mean to a, a post secondary institution, a college, even if it's to a non credit course or a college level credit course? So I guess could you speak to the um, what transition is defined as in, in the dashboard you just showed? Yeah, transition is defined uh, the same way it is on an adult education pipeline. And that would be transition to, and you know, it's actually a really good question. I have always thought it was to any um, non-credit, uh, to a credit bearing course or a CTE course. So that is my understanding, but can you, if you give me a sec, um, I will verify that by the end of the um, by the end of our presentation so ha hang on so we'll um, I'll come back to that thank you for that question um, and for adding to, to to reinforcing what my knowledge so I'll um, dig into that but right now we just wanted to for this moment, Let's take a look at how you can look at the comparison of total population of your consortium using that same ACS data to the adult education pipeline um, demographic data. And again, you're gonna want to select your consortium and here you'll have your overall. And then down here you, get, you can um, filter by different demographic groups. For example, this is showing all total individuals served. However, you may want to look at um, just ABE participants. Click on that and it will refresh down to, um, to, ju to just representing the um, demographics for that group. And we have them by the three categories of age, gender, and race, ethnicity. Um, and you could also go into participants with total contact hours. So they, these are a really easy way um, to be able to just look at who's the population in your um, demographic in your consortium, and then look at your demographics by your group, and then thinking about how those overlay and what that means. Questions about that? All right. There's my slide. I got so involved in screen changing, I forgot to show the slide, but there's that. I did want to point out that on um, the ACS only does um, binary categories of uh, gender. So at times on the adult education pipeline side, you will see that we have the non-binary that we've included um, in, uh, in our representation. So we may have, at times you may have three categories. ACS will only ever have two categories. So that is one of the differences. And so then we're gonna, we, we will then after you've done your comparison, you know your demographics, you know your CAPE demographics and outcomes, and you're going to want to turn your view to um, the labor, labor market information. I'm gonna turn it over to our labor market expert, Lexi. Thank you so much, Blair. All right, so now we can dig into everybody's favorite section of the three-year planning process, which is how do your educational services reflect your local economy? Um, so with that, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Just so you know, we'll see what happens here. <clears throat> you should all be able to see uh, the tab that says labor, labor market information. At, most of you have noticed um, as the links have been flowing through the chat box that when you first hit the fact sheets, it's gonna to default to the first tab on population demographics. So you're gonna to have to come over here to labor market information um, and click this little tab right here. 
And again, the purpose of this section, right, is to help you complete the uh, assessment portion of the three-year planning process. Um, the guidance document, the PDF guidance document, actually provides um, some research questions that should help stimulate exactly what you should be looking for on this labor market information page. Um, so what are your top industries? What types of certificates or non-degree awards are they accepting, um, et cetera? <clears throat> so once we get to this tab, the first thing we're going to do is you can see it's going to default to this kind of aggregate for all consortiums. Oh, see, it just popped back. OK, good. <clears throat> it's going to default to the aggregate. So the first thing you have to do is look over at your geographic region, and you're going to have to filter by location. So please note, we have ma macro regions. So if you click on this, you can see all of the different macro regions you should be familiar with. Then we also have the state of California's micro regions, um, some overlap with those macro regions. And then we actually pulled by county so that you can disaggregate based on your primary location, um, acknowledging that when it comes to serving um, those low income populations, those underserved populations, um, sometimes you do need to drill down and narrow that analysis. So you're identifying exactly where those populations are and what are the economic opportunities for them? What are those employment opportunities? So let's just start. And you'll notice that you have to keep something checked on these little drop down menus. So the minute you take away all, it's going to blank out the entire sheet. So because of my familiarity, I'm just going to click on South Central Coast. That'll bring us back to the South Central Coast. I'm just going to leave the micro region at all. And then let's see, I'm going to further go down and, and I'm going to drill into say, let's just go ahead and go to Ventura. And I did see a couple of my prior colleagues on there. So hopefully this is useful for you. Um, some personalized uh, ed education here. Um, so you're going to see here the unemployment rate. And mind you, had I not chosen Ventura, had I just kept on all, we provided you with your Bureau of Labor Statistics unemployment rate here. But if you're looking at a macro region or a micro region, it's going to be an average of all of the counties engaged in that region. So this is as of June 2021, um, because this is not a live data sheet, right? This is like a point in time. So we figured June is pretty good. And according to uh, August um, numbers actually is pretty reflective. Current um, uh, labor market information on unemployment is fairly reflective to May and June um, of earlier. We seem to be going up and down with this recovery here. Um, so I'm gonna go back to Ventura. I'm gonna choose that. And then I'm gonna come over here to filter by education level. So this is the other thing we wanna do because the first thing that's gonna pop up is everything under the sun in that region. But you wanna be very specific to what you're doing in your adult education schools. So over here, we have several different options for you to choose. So I'm gonna uncheck all, and then I'm gonna check, first of all, post-secondary non-degree award. So that's going to tell me what type of technical certifications are in demand in my region. You can see here when I popped in Ventura, it disaggregated that unemployment rate, gave me a 6.4% for June of 2021. And you come down here and you're going to see your 10 largest industry sectors. When you hover over the bars, you can see um, the same similar data in there, but just in a little bar tab, um, 49,975 jobs in healthcare and social assistance. This is according to your two-digit NAICS codes, right? So your larger industry classification codes. Um, figured that was ample for your three-year planning process. And then we're going to come over here and you see the 10 fastest growing occupations. Now note, these aren't your largest occupations, right? These aren't the occupations with the vast majority of openings either. These are simply your fastest growing occupations looking at a five-year estimated change. So when we come down here to the bottom of our LMI page, we're going to see our 2020 jobs, the 20 to 2020, 2020 to 2025 estimated projected change, right? You can see a nice percentage here, which is why you see wind turbine service technicians, right? For those of us into alternative energy, we're excited to see that job growth. But then you look at the actual jobs and you see, gee, there's only 11. <laughs> and only three more are expected to come into this territory in the next five years. Um, then over here, you will see your median hourly earnings. And finally, in the last column, 
we have a new data point for you. It's your, it's your cost of living adjusted median hourly earnings. So to give you a little background of cost of living, um, this is an index that's published by the Council for Community and Economic Research. It's recognized by the US Census Bureau and US Bureau of Labor Statistics. And the index comprises six primary categories for expenditures in a local area. That includes food, housing, um, utilities, transportation, healthcare, and miscellaneous goods and services. So what we did here for you, instead of giving you the cost of living for the region, we gave you the adjusted cost of living for your median hourly earnings. So this takes into consideration what the cost of living in is that region, and if indeed this is the occupation that you should be focusing on, or this is the career pathway you should be focusing on for your students, because these could highly vary. The other thing I want to note is that when you choose your entry level education or whatever other filter that you want, as you scroll down, this last table is already going to be aligned to, to this third column, the percent estimate projected change. Now, if you wanted to take a look at just the largest quantity of jobs in the area, we can come over here and we press this filter, right? And you see this little arrow here? This will take us and align the entire table to largest quantity of jobs. So as we see here in this area, heavy um, and tractor trailer driven truck drivers, that's a large portion of the jobs. Um, and then we go on to nursing assistants, et cetera. So just so you know, that's available in every column. You could go over to median hourly earnings, click that little drop down arrow, and it's going to give us the highest median hourly earnings for your selected region. Okay. Now, if you cruise back up here and you go over to typical entry level education again, say you're more interested in um, instead of finite degrees through adult education, IET, IELCE. Um, which a great data point to reference that against uh, post-secondary non-degree awards is really the percent is your student surveys. Um, the WAS surveys are some of them that ask those questions. Why are you here? What are you interested in? Um, if you have a large proportion that are there for ESL and a large proportion that are there for to get a job, to get a better job or to get a pay raise, that's a good cross-reference of data points to let you know that an IELCE might be just up your alley and it has additional funding attached to it, right? So if we come up here and you're interested in, instead of the more finite technical degrees, you want to look at career pathways and you want to look at career pathways in association with your community colleges. So you're going to go ahead and click associate degree right here and it's still going to give you um, similar variables here, but if we come up here and we uncheck our post-secondary non-degree awards, right, this is going to give us another advantage. Now we see that our 10 fastest growing occupations are actually occupational therapy assistants, vet techs, um, physical therapy assistants, and then we go into agriculture, food science, etc., aerospace and engineering. Once again, your 10, the table down here at the bottom is going to reflect your 10 fastest growing occupations and you can change that um, based on quantity of jobs. There we go, education came right up to the top, okay? And then we also have these two other categories that you can further narrow your research to. If you are working closely with your workforce board and you have a connectivity between their OJT program and your adult education program, you might want to check the box, um, something like less than five years work experience, right? Or you come over here to typical on the job training and you can see, I'll just leave it at all there. You can see how this changed, right? So now if there's actual work experience required, it's going to pull up those categories. And this knowledge, this information is taken from a, a a panacea of information on job posting. So it's your real-time labor market information. Um, so you see here magnetic resonance imaging technologists and who knew, funeral home directors and managers, they needed some on the job training. Um, and then over here, we can come back up to here and look at apprenticeships, internships, long-term OJT, moderate OJT, short-term OJT, whatever it is we choose, or we could just say none. If we checked a short time OJT, there might be something there, they might not. If we check none, it'll scoop back to what we had before. Um, 
So, and we can also come back up here. If we check all again, it's gonna go back to there. And then we can reevaluate looking at our on the job training. Is it an internship? Is it an apprenticeship? Let's see if there's anything that popped up, nothing popped up. So it looks like for this region that we were looking at, here we go, moderate term on the job training. This might be a nice connectivity with your workforce board with regard to those OJT dollars they have and connecting students, your adult education students to those OJT programs so they can acquire that on the job training that they'll need should you decide that you wanna go ahead and implement an IET program in this field. Um, and as you can scroll down, you see down here at the bottom that changed again, because remember our parameters changed. So now we're looking at moderate on the job training with an associate degrees. We come up here with chemical technicians, ag and food techs, medical equipment repairs, et cetera. And again, you can always change this based on hourly earnings. Just click that little arrow down and you'll go to the highest wage earnings there. All right. Are there any questions on this? And I'm going to go ahead and look at the chat. Let's see, there are, there is one um, that was, um, uh, I think I got most of them. Um, so Emma was asking, and I, I don't, do you see that one? I, don't I do see that and I do know, yes. Program. Do you so know that strong. good? Yeah, thank you, Blair. So Emma, um, Yes, uh, the labor market information that Strong Workforce Program uses is uh, based on Center of Excellence research, as you know, but that research uses the same database that we did, which is Economic Modeling Inc., your EMSI database. So these numbers, this data, and these data points will match any COE report that's coming out on LMI data as long as they're referencing the same data points, same years, et cetera. Notice we have particular parameters here, the 2020 to 2025 estimated, um, et cetera. And then we also do the macro region and the micro region, but it is indeed um, the same data source as strong workforce funds. Um, and then I also noticed that somebody asked about earlier on, asked about if people were using this process for the Perkins environmental scam, scan. I would also agree that everything here in these, in these fact sheets are absolutely relevant and absolutely um, viable use for environmental scans. It really consolidates all of your ACS data. As Blair mentioned earlier, we're gonna be updating that to 2020 um, census data. And then again, the labor market information, while we're doing that, we'll probably update the unemployment rate. Um, but um, all of this information can be used for any type of ed plan, environmental scan. And it's exactly the, the federal references that you need. So just so you know, the database that this information is taken from the same database that the COEs use, um, this is Bureau of Labor Statistics information that comes from our quarterly census on employment and wages, as well as the Bureau of Labor Statistics job report. Were there any additional questions? Yes, then? Lexi, yes. sorry. Thanks for posting again, Ryan. I knew there was something and I lost it in the, in the chat. So um, he was asking whether, if to your knowledge, has EDD updated projections for post-pandemic considerations or impacts to industries? Uh, that's an excellent question. Well done. Um, the EDD is, pro is working on it. Unfortunately, at the federal, at the national, state, and local level, projections for this pandemic have been extremely um, difficult because the recovery is so unlike everything we've ever seen before. We have this K-shaped recovery where um, uh, highly educated bachelor's, master's degrees individuals didn't really experience a lot of that job loss, um, has proceeded to inflate our housing market, right, um, and, and contribute to overall inflation with our goods, um, whereas all of those entry-level and lower-skilled, middle-skilled jobs, those are the ones that are lost and very hard to predict when they're going to come back. So EDD has been thinking about it, but again, um, geez, the Federal Reserve can't even predict that right now. So I, I wouldn't rely on projections like that. This is where your engagement with industry is extremely valuable because it really all depends on your locale. 
if your adult education school is located somewhere like Orange County, you could conceivably have different parameters for reopening than someplace like Los Angeles County, right? That's a lot bigger. So excellent question. And it's just a really, really hard thing to predict right now because we've never seen this and classical economic functions and, um, and formulas are simply not working anymore. They're not telling us, they're not indicating what they used to indicate. Um, but we'll keep you apprised of that if we find anything when we do the update on the census data. Thanks, Lexi. I'm yeah, no sure problem. there will probably be some more questions that crop up, but I'm gonna go ahead and uh, move us along because we're a little bit behind schedule. Okay. Um, so let me just go back. I'm gonna monitor the chat just in case anybody else has any LMI information. Um, and uh, Blair, I think we were gonna move through this and I'm sorry I went straight into that, that deck slide, but here are some of those questions that were in that guidance. Yeah, no, this is perfect. I just pulled it back as the, that's where we were. And so those are the questions. Again, I'm just pointing this out that there are the fact sheets um, and there's always the possibility to dig a little bit deeper by looking at county commuting patterns. And if you want to see what that looks like, there's in there will be some resources on how to look at county commuting patterns, as well as how to use the poverty map um, that will be posted soon to, to that those will be posted to the AEP website and the resource, the library resource library. Um, and so if you all have any additional sources that you use for demographic data, like Marianne, you were talking about getting some different, some um, maybe more refined data at the city level, please feel free to share those in the chat with your colleagues. So, and very briefly, once you've explored your LMI, then you're also going to want to look at your programming. Um, you're going to want to evaluate your educational offerings and align them, make sure they're aligned to living wage job opportunities. And we know sometimes dependent on the level of your learners that that could be very, that that's difficult, um, that they can't go directly into a living wage um, opportunity, either because of language or literacy and numeracy skills or technology or digital skills. However, you always want to consider that they're part of a, of a career pathway. And so watching, you know, comparing those, and these are some questions that you'll want to ask yourself and um, to prompt you to query about your current offerings and whether they are aligning to your local labor market data, to student interests, always something you need to consider and to help them as well as looking at ways to build those academic and occupational skills. Uh, and then while you assess these and look at them from all these different angles, it can propel you into identifying some new programming, but also some new collaborations and stakeholders. Another way resource that many of you have um, heard us present on um, is this dashboard, this California Regional Education to Workforce dashboard. Um, and this one, it can help you identify existing pathways in your consortium um, and determine whether those offerings align to need. And if you're targeting, again, those living wage jobs, because it has a filter over here um, on the right, where you can look at self-sufficiently hourly wage. Um, and we there's also a user guide. If you're not familiar with it, you can ask us and we can do a training on it, or there's a user guide that you might be able to use. Um, and now I had promised that we would do something actually interactive. Alex is going to lead um, sort of a way to begin to look at data and explore questions about that. Thank you, Blair, and thank you all. Um, so I um, am lucky to, I think, have the task to bring in a little interactivity, although recognizing that's no easy feat um, given all of the information that you all have absorbing and been interacting with. Um, but we really wanted to take just a few minutes um, to do what is called a, a data equity walk. Um, our goal is twofold. One, to give you all the chance to kind of uh, get that data brain of working and start kind of looking and, and thinking through some of the data that's available in these tools. The second is that we wanted to provide and an model um, very quickly, give you a glimpse of a facilitation tool that you could choose to use with your consortia as you lead your planning process. Um, and notably, this is a tool that can be done virtually as you're all about to experience, um, which uh, depending on sort of the situation in your consortia, we hope might be helpful um, for planning uh, this year. So this data equity walk, what is it? We're gonna give you a quick sprint of an overview um, around what 
it is, but essentially it's a data deep dive, um, typically used in educational settings. Um, the goal is to really prompt thinking questions and most notably collaboration. Um, it gives folks the chance to make comparisons, identify patterns, highlight gaps and successes. Um, and it's really about allowing for some individual exploration and then structuring some collective exploration um, so that you're really bringing folks together and bringing minds together to focus, prioritize, and uh, figure out what avenues to pursue. Um, and full credit uh, for this goes to the Education Trust West uh, that have developed a whole toolkit. Um, we'll offer some resources, but uh, the, the link is in the PowerPoint for anyone more who wants to see more there. So what I will ask, uh, Blair, you can move to the next slide just for a minute um, and give folks a chance to um, see and uh, pull out this, the link. I'll also post this in the chat. And then I'm actually gonna invite you to join me um, at this link. We're gonna be using a Jamboard. I know a few of you um, have been in uh, sessions with me before, so know this, and I imagine um, others may be familiar with this tool, but I'll invite you to join us on a Jamboard and I'll just uh, give us a chance to try this out a little bit. So um, share, uh, uh, Blair, I'll go ahead and share my screen. Oh, and we have folks joining already. That is fantastic. Um, okay, so you should be able to see it here. Y'all, can y'all see my Jamboard? Mm -hmm. Can I get a thumbs up, Blair? Yes, I can awesome. see it. Great, thank you, <laughs> thank you. Um, great, so excellent, welcome. Um, so for those of you who are new um, to Jamboard, this is a Google tool. Um, and this is, it's sort of think of it as a virtual whiteboard or sort of wall where we would normally be sticking post-its and hanging up posters. Um, this is a chance uh, to do and approximate that as much as we can in a virtual setting. So there's two important um, sort of uh, tools to navigate this um, that I'll highlight. There's a, a lot more functionality and always happy to chat with this if anyone who's interested. But the two that we'll use for our purposes or just if you go over to the left, you'll see um, this middle uh, square icon. If you press on that, that's the sticky note. So that's how you're gonna engage with the tool. That's where you're gonna add your great ideas here and it will show up um, for your colleagues to see. And then um, the other piece that you'll just need is the navigation tool, which is up here. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take a look at a few different slides, a few different uh, data points that have been pulled from the tools that you've just, uh, you've just been introduced to. And we'll give you just a chance to sort of get a flavor of this by reviewing the slides and using the sticky notes to share two things, what you notice and what you wonder about the graphs. So that's where we're gonna start. And then um, I don't think we'll have time to get this to the day uh, today, but the second part of this is taking some time to lead a group discussion around some prompts. Uh, in this case, the prompts would be what gaps or areas of concern do you see that you'd like to address in the planning and what else do you need to know? So let me pause. Are there any big concerns in the chat that would be helpful for me to walk through? I don't think so. All right. Like Alex, I just yeah. want to say that um, yeah. that the that the Jamboard is saying that it's overly full, that the, the number of people oh, accessing you. it is limited. So, so I don't know there. if there's a way to do that or yeah. expand it. Yeah, so it's interesting. So I'm seeing 28 total viewers. Uh, I will actually note that uh, the limit of the Jamboard is typically 50. Um, uh, so not everyone would be able to get on, unfortunately, right now, although I didn't want to warn you of that too early and dissuade people from trying. Um, I am a, unfortunately can't tell you why we're sort of being locked out at only 25, but I will note that that is um, a challenge of this tool in particular. It's best for sort of smaller groups. There are a few other tools um, that I'd be happy to speak to that allow for larger numbers. So for those of you who are who made it into the Jamboard, I hope you bear and feel the, the uh, power and responsibility that you have for our, our next five minutes. For those who didn't and would like to participate, please feel free to add your comments in the chat or of course note as well. So what we did was we just pulled um, and wanted to, to give some time to look at who was being served by adult education programs across the state. This will not be tailored. Uh, we're looking at state level data and pulled um, some screenshots from the tools as I mentioned that you just saw. 
So the first, um, okay, the data on the slide is too small for, to see for those of us with vision issues. I thank you for that upfront honesty um, and appreciate that. That is challenging. Um, I will say that uh, for those who might be dealing with that, another area of functionality is you can actually zoom in um, using this little uh, zoom tool here to make it smaller and a little easier to see. Um, and so I'll invite folks to do that if that's helpful. Um, if you feel like that is also um, not the right, right fit for where you are, um, then that's something certainly to consider. If you already going to use a tool like that, you might want to show fewer data um, and have more slides um, so that it's easier to make it bigger. Okay, but for those of you who are able, I just invite to add a few uh, post-its sharing kind of what do you notice about this data and what does this data make you wonder? Mm -hmm. 50 and older is a very large group, that's true, that's true. Really very, a lot of, should be a lot of variance in the 50 and older group, but uh, the census data groups that all together. Mm -hmm. Anything else? Only 60% of, uh, of folks are unemployed. And I'll actually note that this isn't students. So this will be, this is statewide uh, population. So yes, only 60% of uh, statewide population is employed. 36% not in the labor force and 4% unemployed. Mm -hmm. Anything else? Adults with children would be good to have. So I, I um, see and hear that there's some interest in wondering um, about uh, what is the percentage of adults that have children? That's good. Okay. Excellent. Notice that over 59% have some college or higher education attainment. Excellent. Great. And oh, what a nice segue. I see the green over here. I wonder how this data aligns with our students served. Excellent, excellent question. Um, and we will be getting that into that in uh, just a minute. So for the sake of time, um, oh yeah, race, ethnic, okay. Hi, EL needed. Indigenous languages. So a lot of interest in wanting to know um, some more detailed information which is of course a very important and natural part of this process. And as Blair had mentioned, because this is an iterative process, these are the types of conversations that can allow you to point um, to other information that could be helpful to have. Excellent. All right, so much. It's great to see this populated. For the sake of time, we're gonna move along. But if, if this was happening, um, that uh, in real time, you'd wanna be able to provide a lot of time to really work through, discuss some of these um, what's being noticed and then what questions there might be. Excellent. Okay. Awesome. So yeah, needing more information. So um, another example, we don't need to go into this, I think for the sake of time, but here you might wanna take a look. So uh, this is just showing what it might look like to take some time to dive a little bit more deeply and look a little closer. So this is a screenshot of um, the 6.2 million, uh, million Californians that are living near poverty or less, so that 150,000 or 150% of the poverty level. Um, and so here you could take a little bit of a closer look into that subset of the California population to look a little bit more deeply. Um, since I saw, okay, and so then we have our AEP students. So these are screenshots that were taken from the AEP, the adult education pipeline dashboard. This would give you a chance to take a look um, at uh, who is being served within the programs and do a slightly uh, more detailed comparison there. And then for the sake of time, I'll let us sit here. This is an example of, of um, that, uh, dashboard that, um, that Blair had just walked us through, that the direct comparison between the ACS demographics and the adult education pipeline 2020 demographics. So I'll invite you to hear, we'll still here for a minute, and just ask, what do you notice and what do you wonder within, um, within this data here? So I'll invite folks, you can go to slide six if you're following along. Oh, I see some folks there. 
Oops. Mm -hmm. Emily, notice or wonder anything on the slide? Mm hmm. Excellent. And if you don't have access, but you can still notice, please feel free to use the chat as a sticky. <laughs> Great, so yes, um, close to 60% of students um, in adult education are Hispanic. So we see that as an over uh, representation from the overall state. So it's, yeah. More female students than in the population, fantastic. Yeah, by 10 percentage points. A lot of 18 to 29 year olds, great. Again, yep, high percentage of people over 50 and older. So there could be a lot of interest in really diving more deeply into that uh, demographic group, given the large, uh, large subset of, of the population that that captures. Mm -hmm. Yeah, fewer male students being served. So that um, could lead to a really, I think, interesting discussion around why and what might uh, be done to help uh, attract uh, more male students. Great. Awesome. Excellent. Yeah. A huge percentage of students do not have over 12 contact hours. Absolutely. And we have actually um, a few other of a, uh, we actually even had a slide that uh, for the sake of time we pulled out that looked at that, looking at the differences uh, within demographics um, by race and ethnicity. So that could be a really interesting um, line of inquiry. So yeah, okay. And so then once um, the chance, oh great, okay. Oh, more added, yeah. Sorting by age, gender and sex would be good to compare, absolutely. So a need to do more. Um, more detailed disaggregations could be great. Yeah, excellent. Um, oh, interesting. So uh, thinking about the intersection between housewives, so gender, um, ESL, English language learners, family status, um, and really pursuing kind of and, and looking to understand that population more. So the idea here is that this could, if we're doing this, for example, for the first time around, could allow to spark a number of different other questions that would be interesting to pursue. And then this could be repeated again with more detailed data and then uh, really used to identify some of those priority gaps um, or areas of inquiry that you might want to pursue. And so um, after folks have time to really engage with the data, can bring folks around to get people to share kind of what gaps or areas of concern um, they notice what other information they want to see. I really love getting a lot of ideas up at once and then allowing folks to vote and really prioritize what they feel like needs to be top of uh, the next step as a way uh, yeah, to really provide that collaborative uh, work together, particularly when you're working with many different stakeholders um, in many different places. So I will, we won't spend time on this. I wanna thank so, uh, folks so much for just joining in this quick sprint. And I'll also note that if you are interested in using something like this, um, you can actually take this, uh, this is linked within the PowerPoint, make a copy um, and you're free to use this how you see fit. So you can replace um, the screenshots here um, using the, there's some work here or tools here to add images. Um, and so you are more than welcome to use this. And if you would like help in sort of putting this together, um, it's a pretty easy tool once you get used to it. So always helpful, um, happy to provide that guidance. So count this as a tool in your toolkit. Um, and with that, I will turn things over uh, back to Blair. Thank you. Can you see the PowerPoint again? Yay, we're back to the PowerPoint. Anyway, I love the conversation that's going on. That's exactly what it's supposed to do. You have all these resources that we presented and then you pull them together and have really substantive questions. And I could begin to see people moving into the why where you then um, do some more, um, some follow up with the data and begin to just really query and refine the knowledge um, of, what, of what's going on in your consortium or in your institution, um, because you can do this at various levels. But we'll just quickly walk through. We have 12 minutes left. I'm going to race through asset mapping. 
um, when we were chatting about the time flying, um, I noted that I'm really glad that there is a more in-depth presentation on asset mapping. So let's just take a, a quick gander at it though. So here's the process that we talk about is the learners in the place. You wanna take map them, adult education services, your transitions. And by this, I mean the transitions to other programs and to employment and to training so that you are looking at multiple layers because we all know that our learners do not have unified goals. Um, and so you need to look at where those transitions are occurring. Um, and we haven't really talked about that except to the where we were talking about to the CTA or um, post-secondary courses. So, um, so when you get that, you wanna pull in some of that additional um, information such as commuting, transportation, where are employers, and begin to really layer those on, as well as then you come back and then you reflect and um, assess and you identify those gaps, the alignment and the transitions um, to that you might want to um, think further about. Um, one of the things that we haven't talked about is a different kind of um, gathering some different data. And we would suggest that you offer up some, um, you do some focus groups or some interviews with learners, for example. Um, what Once you've got your map built, um, facilitate a process for them to look at the map and what they see on the map, um, what, what are the benefits, where are the needs, and have them identify from a perspective that is different from your own. We become very attuned to what is going on, and you need that refresher look at what um, at what learners might need. Uh, there's also employers or your partners. What do they see on the map? What might they need in order to um, engage in this uh, work? And also, what might they they contribute? Your asset mapping is also a really great way to engage people who may not already be um, engaged in the process and really open up some avenues to support new programming bolster new program, um, uh, current programming, or have some great ideas for outreach and um, recruitment. These are some of your questions that you wanna ask during reflection and assessments from the basics to, you know, what services are offered all the way down to what I was talking about, um, what are the opportunities that exist for collaborations? Um, pulling people in and having them look at the map and doing an equity walk is another way to do that, just structuring it a little bit differently. Um, but getting the different voices and having them in a different perspective other than in just a meeting or in a, um, or taking a survey. These, the focus groups and asking questions and bringing people to the table for in a conversation that's directly attuned to your asset map is a really good way to get that, get new information and different kind of information. And then putting it all together. Now we've gone through all these different pieces. You've done your asset mapping. You've gather, gathered a ton of data. You had some conversations um, and you want to create that picture of what's going on. Um, you want to start here with the discussing of what surprised you, what alarmed you, where is your program succeeding, what are takeaways, what have you learned, that you are not going straight to solution building, right? You um, take the time to have that conversation and think about new learnings or surprises that can then drive you into um, solution building. Um, you want to then take this discussion and then you synthesize it and then refocus it, right? So identifying, then you move into identifying what might your targets be? What are your goals? Um, and these include questions that aren't just the, the, the ones that are related to um, your NOVA data and your three-year plan, but it's also about who needs to be brought to the table uh, and to inform your processes and build your programming to help you meet your goals. So this slide is just a quick place where we have put together all of the different resources that we talked about. Um, and oh, I need to add the link. See, it's so brand new. I didn't put the link in this very last space where the Cap Cape Fact Sheets Toolkit is. Um, those will, some of these will be coming up. Others will are already um, are already developed. Uh, these are some of the additional resources that we have on the adult education um, uh, resource library, including some of the informational webinars um, and the Cape uh, um, administrators website is a great place to go and look for those archived webinars. Um, and then also there's the adult education pipeline. 
uh, and then the dashboard that we talked about. And that we have now come to, we did want to give just a tiny bit of space for any additional questions. Are there any in the chat? Are there comments? Are there resources that you thought? Um, so Wendy is asking about getting the slide deck um, before the recording to be remediated. Um, Wendy, uh, we need to remediate. There are a couple of issues uh, for 508 compliance on the PowerPoint. Um, if I will uh, work at getting that done and out no later than Monday. We unfortunately can't post it without having that compliance review. So, um, and so yes, we will work. Thanks, Wendy. Uh, it's it's uh, it can be a little bit of work when you've got all these images. I'm learning to do people. If people don't like the text, but now I'm I think oh I kind of like those text heavy ones because I don't have to remediate them, which is which it makes it not much fun. So we're really becoming much more expert in um, remediating remediating our PowerPoint so that they are available to everyone and accessible to everyone, which is as it should be. Um, were there any questions, resources that you would like us to think about? I will reiterate up the front, this is this is, was a sampler. Um, there's been a lot that we've covered. We will be doing more in depth um, webinars, but also we're happy to do some just one-on-one -on -one trainings or we can do a consort, we can leave consortia through some of this information, uh, facilitate conversations. This is, this was really, to say, this is some of our team. We have many more people um, on the team that can um, support your efforts in your three-year plan. We know it's it's a it's a process and it's an ongoing process, and we would be happy to to work with you all. Whether it's the adult education pipeline, LMI comparisons between demographics and um, AEP. Oh yeah, <laughs> it was the best ever. <laughs> We were wondering if we'd get through all of it. But yeah, we've been working hard and we're excited. We're still working um, on getting some more different resources out. We'll be announcing them through the Kate newsletter as well as through webinars as they come ready. I'd like to say thank you so much to the SCOE TAP team who um, as facilitates all of our webinars, gets the message out, really appreciate getting us set up. And thanks to all of you for hanging in there through an hour and a half presentation. Um, it's delightful for, we appreciate you participating um, and any feedback, people who notified us that they've got some missing data, we'll take a look at that and then um, give some follow-up on it. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you so much, West Ed team. It's always a pleasure to host your events. We really appreciate all of the jam-packed information you share um, and your willingness to always connect um, with people individually or at a consortium level. So with that, um, we're going to just start to close it out. And again, I want to thank everybody who joined today. It's the third day of the director's event. Um, like Blair mentioned, please take a moment to give West Dead some feedback in the evaluation link posted in the chat by my colleague, Holly Clark. We will share a copy of the presentation and add it to the website once it is remediated, um, including the video, which does take a little bit of time because it's done by a third party vendor. Um, but we'll, we understand that this is all valuable, important information, and we will get it up as soon as possible. Um, also, please be sure to join us tomorrow for the new consortia lead onboarding training from 8.30 to 2.30, Friday's goal setting and targets from 8.30 to 10, and the community asset mapping from 10.30 to 12. Um, as a reminder, if you haven't already registered, the Summit 2021 registration is open, so please register for that if you haven't already. We'll go ahead and drop a link for that registration site here in just a moment. And um, I believe with that, we'll go ahead and start to close it out. Thank you again, everybody, for participating. It's always great to see you, even in a virtual format.